I'm here to talk about code play and kind of the value of uh, creativity and coding. But the way I'm going to do that is sort of like approaching the knight in a game of chess. Knight's a dangerous guy, right? You've got this ring of fire around you. You don't want to uh, get caught up in that. But what you can do is get really, really close. And you're actually safe. You're flying in under the radar so far into the danger zone that, that you're not getting squashed. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show some examples of my work that kind of dance around the idea of code play. And hopefully that <laughs> promotes some discussion. So. so the first thing I'm going to start with is browser Pong. Uh, sometimes playfulness is about taking something uh, mundane, like a browser window, and giving it uh, this new behavior that's kind of unexpected and surprising. So first, we're all familiar with Pong, right? Electronic tennis? Yes? Yes? OK. Um, it was actually called electronic tennis before Atari uh, borrowed it and gave us Pong, which is a, kind of fine. They, they redesigned it, and they made it really beautiful. So, uh, so this is it. This is browser Pong. This is my, my version of Pong. Uh, when you load up this website, you just get this stripped-down interface, and it looks like you're about to play a game of Pong, right? It's suggesting press P for play. You've got your up and down arrow keys to operate your paddle. But it's kind of a bait and switch in the sense that uh, you're not about to play Pong in this window. You're going to play Pong with windows. So when you, when you hit play, it actually spawns new pop-up windows that you play with. So I'll show you what that looks like. And we should have some sound. Yes. So all the sounds for Browser Pong were done by a, a friend and collaborator, Dominic Matar, is a sound artist in New York City. He made the uh, Browser Pong theme. So this is a recording of me playing against the computer. I'm losing. I'm, I'm green on the right-hand side, and the computer is red. Actual gameplay. And uh, we're going to fast forward, and you can see my come from behind victory. So here we are, 8 to 10. Game, yes. So there are some tricks to the game. Uh, I didn't tell anyone about this, but players figured it out themselves. You can cheat. You can resize the browser window. Now I can make sure the computer doesn't stand a chance. This is my favorite, though. <laughs> it's, it's so zen, right? It just, yeah. Oh, it's a bit quiet, but that's fine. Um, if you win uh, two out of three games, you get to hear the Mr. Pong song. And if you win three to nothing, you get Rickrolled. So if you like those sounds, you should look for uh, Dominic Matar online. He's great. Oh, what is this about? OK, I guess an extra slide got stuck in there somewhere. Um, OK, so that's Browser Pong. Uh, I was really excited when I launched it. Um, within 24 hours, I got 100,000 unique views. So I was like, yes. Um, and uh, one of the things that helped out with that, <laughs> the nerds in the audience are like, yeah, that's OK. That's, yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I did is I put this in the uh, browser Pong source code, and it says, uh, first of all, thank you for caring. Um, not everyone views source code. And uh, I hope that this is clean enough and interesting enough to be useful to you. And that really struck a chord with the coding community. And so this uh, ended up on Hacker News and Slashdot and some other places and uh, helped it to go viral, which is really great. And then. Um, uh, a month after I released Browser Pong, Google uh, asked me if they could put it in their um, sorry, Chrome Experiments library. And I uh, said yes. <laughs> thought that was great. So that's it for Browser Pong. Uh, next up is Judd's other poem, which is a music video. And here I feel like playfulness has to do with anthropomorphism, trying to take uh, emotions and uh, push them into an inanimate object, make something a character. 
and uh, I'll, I'll show you that. Um, but first, I just want to back up a little bit. Uh, as a child, I was exposed to typewriters, and I thought they were fascinating. I thought it was great how um, you could imagine something, create a story in your head, and then you're physically pressing these levers and embossing uh, metal and ink into paper, and you're creating this physical artifact. And uh, this idea of typing as performance has really stuck with me, even in uh, my coding. And you'll see it in this video. So uh, Granddaddy, I don't know if you're familiar, <coughs> sorry, familiar with this band. In 2000, they put out this record, The Software Slump. And uh, I love it. <laughs> And uh, I can kind of describe their music, I think, by just describing the album cover. What you see here is this beautiful pastoral scene, uh, valley, uh, trees, flowers, nature. And then these keyboard keys that are just kind of ripped off of their keyboards and stuck on uh, to show you the album title. And I, I think that's kind of where they sit musically. They have kind of uh, humanity and nature and then broken down technology all mushed together. So there's a song in this record, Jed's Other Poem, and it's about a, a sad robot, a robot that uh, wrote poetry before he died. <laughs> so if you can imagine such a song. And I decided I wanted to make a music video for this, but I needed a character. So uh, what I decided the character should be is this old 1979 Apple II Plus, which is a fantastic machine, by the way. But it's so old that uh, there's no mouse, there's no graphic user uh, interface. And uh, it only types in capitals, excuse me. And uh, it has a bunch of other limitations, but I decided I didn't care. I thought the constraints were uh, really good for this project. So, uh, so I'll show you the video now. It's about three minutes, uh, so just relax and enjoy some granddaddy. Apparently before Jed had left us He wrote some poems Wrote them for no one But I guess I'll show them Here's one of Jed's poems <laughs> just lists the current program in memory. 
And uh, that's what's happening here. You can put that command in a program itself, and so when the program executes, it lists itself, which I thought was kind of uh, beautiful and recursive, and uh, it's like the computer spilling its guts to you. I actually had a guy uh, email me all the code that he could transcribe before it zooms out and becomes illegible. And uh, so he emailed me this block of code and he said, how can I get the rest? And I thought, wow, that's a good question. How do you get the rest? Because you're starting with this machine. The only media that it uses is this floppy disk, right? Like one of the actual large floppy disks. There's no, no USB, no Firewire, uh, no CD burner. Uh, and I suppose if you had a modem, you might connect it through Kermit to the internet, but I wouldn't know what to do with that. So, so I thought there was no way to get the code off of it. I thought I'd have to transcribe it myself until I was reminded that you can save data to audio cassettes. <laughs> There's actually an audio port on the back of every Apple II and Commodore and uh, similar machines. And so this was great. What it meant is that I could hook up this old computer to my laptop with an audio cable and just play the data as sound and record that sound on my laptop. And then I ran that through an Apple II emulator and I was able to get back the source code. So uh, once I did that, I open sourced the music video. And as far as I know, it's the first open source music video. I released it as a text, as, <laughs> as a disk image for emulators and as an audio file. And the audio file turned out to be really important uh, when this happened, I don't know if you're familiar with Panic Software. They make uh, some nice apps for the Mac. Uh, they had just gotten a new iPad this summer, and they were really excited about that. I was really excited when I found out they had an Apple IIe just sitting in their uh, office. So I got in touch with them. What they did is they took the, uh, the Jed Video source code uh, as an audio file, put it into iTunes on the iPad, and then played the code from the iPad to the Apple II. And so they're able to make their own version of the video on their Apple IIe. So that is backwards compatibility. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> and then uh, this kid in Argentina, uh, Nicky Ramon, took my source code and made his own music video for Up the Down Escalator, which is a, a song by the post-punk post -punk band, The Chameleons, which are really good. You should check them out. And here's a little uh, clip from that. All right, so that's, that's Jed's other poem. Uh, next up is Windmaker which is an ambient weather widget, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, if you go to this website, you enter in two pieces of information, a URL and a postal code. So uh, here's an example. I'm going to enter in uh, google.com, and then I'm going to enter in the postal code for their headquarters, which is in Mountain View, California. What Windmaker does is it looks up the current strength of the wind. It, it looks up the current weather conditions for that area and applies it to the website. So this was actually Google's live website, uh, filtered through Windmaker, of course. And then, uh, yeah. and then you can kind of click around, and it's, it's still windy. So you can see it was kind of a windy day when I recorded this in Mountain View, California. And these were the, uh, the headlines. And I really like this idea, this idea of news. Um, if you take something like the New York Times website, or really any news website, you, uh, you're dividing these pieces of information. Um, you have headlines, right? And then you click a link and you go to this other page that gives you the weather. And uh, for better or worse, Windmaker allows you to do both at the same time, to push these two pieces of information through the same visual channel, which I think is a lot like function overloading and programming, which excites me and uh, if there are any other Uber coders in the audience. Uh, but Windmaker also, um, if you have your own website or blog, it will generate the script for you that you can add to your own homepage and make your homepage windy for all of your visitors or seasick. And uh, you can also generate a special bookmark that you drag to your bookmarks bar, navigate to some other site, and then click your bookmark to make that site windy. So that is Windmaker. Next up is Histoface. Uh, sometimes being playful is about hide and seek as is the case here. Histoface is a typeface made for histogram windows. 
What does that mean? Um, I'll show you. We, we can start with Maggie the cat. Uh, if we take Maggie the cat and we bring this image into Photoshop, we can open the levels adjustment window. And what this is showing us is a histogram of uh, the brightest bright parts of the image and the darkest dark parts and the spectrum in between. And you use this for doing uh, color correction and contrast correction on an image. Uh, this guy, David Friedman, he runs the blog, Ironic Sands. Uh, he posted this image on his blog and he challenged readers to find the hidden image in it. So people were just staring at this uh, grayscale gradient going like cross-eyed and blind, trying to, you know, is this a magic eye for the computer screen or something? And it wasn't. One of his readers finally figured it out. He brought it into Photoshop, opened the levels window, and this is what he saw. Skyline of New York City. Uh, dated a bit, but... New York City nonetheless, <clears throat> and I thought this was really cool. I was compelled to figure out, how do you do this? And then I had to code it myself. Uh, just, you know, uh, you know when you feel the urge to do something that's a little bit illogical? <laughs> that's totally what it was. And uh, I thought, if you can do this with uh, images, why not do it with text? And so I created this alphabet. And if this alphabet looks a bit strange, it's because it's dealing with the really tight constraints of histogram imagery. You can't have anything cantilever over itself. Everything has to start at the floor. It can go as high as you'd like, but it can't start mid-height, for instance. And, and so everything ends up looking a bit strange. So I built this interface as well, so you can make your own uh, secret messages. So right now it's just kind of going through the alphabet and numerals. And here's a, a cute little secret message. You render out your image, <laughs> save it to uh, your downloads folder, and open it in Photoshop. And then you go to the levels window, <laughs> and there it is. So now you can all send uh, secret messages to each other in Photoshop. <laughs> OK, uh, last project, I quit. Uh, sometimes being playful is about uh, taking pent-up anxiety and negativity and passing it off as lighthearted humor, as is the case here. Uh, this is a resignation letter generator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what it does is it, it has this whole library of sentences, some for, uh, specifically for openers, uh, closing statements, a ton of body uh, sentences, and they're all really firm and pointed, yet so incredibly ambiguous that you could kind of use it to quit anything. Uh, I think the tagline is uh, uh, your job, your relationship, your friends. Uh, get out of anything instantly with I quit. <laughs> and, and it really does function. What you do is you just put in your email address and then the person or persons you want to quit, confirm it, send it, and you get an email like this one. Uh, let's assume your name is Johnny Appleseed <laughs> for the moment. Uh, it says hello and thank you for using I quit. Are you really sure you want to do this? If so, click the link. And, and yes, you're really sure. So you click the link. And it automatically generates a, random, a randomly composed letter of resignation for you. So if we just take a look at that, uh, this email serves as my formal uh, letter of resignation, effective immediately. It is not my intention to injure feelings with this letter, but to merely illuminate a path toward a more functional environment for myself. My motivation is ebbed to a point of no return, and to prolong the charade is unfair to all concerned. And it just goes on from there. Ambiguous enough to, uh, to use it for just about anything. And so here's just a, a peek behind the scenes, some options that you get for uh, that opening line, which is sort of important, right? So it is with great trepidation that I disclose my intention to discontinue our relationship, for instance. So uh, you can check that out and uh, start destroying uh, friendships and burning bridges. <laughs> and that's, I quit. So hopefully we've kind of danced around this issue of uh, code play without stabbing it and without it stabbing us. And I could go on about current projects or lolcats or everything else that I think is great about the internet, but I'll just scroll through this really quickly. Uh, I, I recently made a music video for Swedish musician Thomas Halberstad, really sweet guy, up and coming. Uh, data visualization that I worked on in Paris two years ago might be coming back around. So fingers crossed that might open in New York uh, this summer. And I'm currently working on this other uh, exhibition piece for the San Francisco MoMA that opens next week. So that's it. All of that stuff is online, so if you're curious, you can check it out. Just check out uh, my website.
Thanks.